الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصلنا على محمد وعلى محمد ربي شرح لي صدري يسر لي أمري وحل الأقضى من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم everybody إن شاء الله the شهر of شعبان تشتيتي ديوال this is going to be our last lecture for this month inshallah before we get into Ramadan um, well, this is lecture 8 in our series um, today's topic is going to be dhikr but as we always do we want to send out the love to Sahib Asbir Saman um, and we do this by the recitation of Dua and Fadaj أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم كن لوليك محبة من حسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آله في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه في وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين. So in the past two lectures we've been looking at the steps for actualization. We first looked at loving Allah subhanahu wa taala and we said that was the overarching goal. We then talked about loving Ahlul Bayt and we kind of we said that loving Ahlul Bayt will lead us to loving. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and today we're going to look at the third step of actualization which is dhikr and this uh, dhikr can also help us in loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, it is also a step of actualization on its own the basic translation for dhikr is remembering or remembrance and we'll stick to this definition for today because we really want to delve into what it means to remember but the first thing we have to realize is what do we need to remember to you know get to the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what we need to remember is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he's not uh, limited by space or time however in the divine intellectual soul lecture we said that the tool that we use to remember is our mind and we said that our mind is not uh, it's not part of our body it's something separate from our body and so it's not limited by our, uh, this material world so the question then comes is our mind then limited to space and time and the answer is yes it is our mind cannot be at one point of space time it can only be in one point of space time at a particular instance it can't be you can't think about the past and the future at the same time. Your mind can only think about one thing at the particular moment. It can't multitask. But to understand this further, we need to understand what the space time is. And so there's this really nice diagram which explains this, and it's called the Minoski diagram. Um, it looks complicated, but we'll try and explain it easily. So the first thing in this diagram that you have to consider is we're going to say that space is not 3D, it's 2D, okay? So it's like a piece of paper. And this piece of paper of space, it moves a long time, okay? So this book, it's changing in height in time. So if there was no time, it wouldn't change. That's what we're saying. So space is changing in time, but it's not changing at the same, the same way. So it's not a straight line. Because if we say that space is changing in time in a straight line, what you're saying is that if I am in this position right now, that in the future I will stay in this position, and in the past I'm also in this position, and I can't move. So there are things in space which can't move, like the mountains, for example. So um, they are in the same place in time. But we humans, we move around in space, correct? which also means that we move around in time. So if you see in this picture, um, there's this curvy line. And this curvy line is us. So because, say, 
10 minutes before this lecture, I was in my room. It means that I moved in different places. So a few minutes before, I was in a different position in space than where I am now. And in the future, so after I finish this, I'll be in my room again. So I'll also move in space. So that's what this diagram shows. So now we'll look at these two cones. Why do we have cones? And the thing is, the past and the future is determined by our actions. So the cone represents all the possible actions that we can do. And these actions are limited by what? By what I'm doing at the moment. So for example, after this lecture, I cannot go and fly outside because I don't have the ability to fly. So flying is not going to be inside my cone. It's going to be somewhere out here. But something that could be in my cone, for example, is I can go and eat or have a drink of water. So that is a possible future for me. So it could be in here. Now, what about the past cone? So why can the past change, let's say, or why isn't the path just a straight line? The reason why the past is in a straight line is because let's take this moment everywhere in the world. Everybody is in the exact position that they are. But a few minutes ago, we were in different positions, all of us. If we were all in the same position all the time, then it would be a straight line. But because everybody interacts, everybody works together to create the present. So the past is different because we were all in different positions and we're all in different places. So that's what it represents. Our mind, however, because it exists along this line, which is us, remember, it doesn't have to stay in the present. Sometimes it goes back and it looks, oh, I played a really fun game yesterday, or do you remember when we went on this trip? That's going into the past. Your mind is going into the past. However, when you start to think about, okay, I need to go shopping and this is stuff that I have to buy, or in the future, I want to go to this place and this place. That is planning for the future. And so your mind is going along here, okay? So that's how our mind can move around. But our body, our body is limited by space. So it can't move around, it only stays in the present. How does this apply to us in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the first question we have to ask is what do we use to uh, keep our relationship? Do we use our body? Do we use our mind? Or do we use something completely different? Is it our soul? Is it our heart? Or do we use both of them? The answer to this question is we use both of them. So what place in space-time can the body and the mind exist at the same time? There's only one place, and that's the present. So if we want to have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has to be in the present. But the thing is, it is so hard to keep our mind in the present. Why? Why is it so hard to keep our mind in the present? The reason is the mind wants to believe that it exists, okay? So if it stops working because it's in the present, when it's in the present, it's not flying around in space time. It's still. And when it's still, it thinks that it's not working or not doing anything. And so not only does it get bored, but it thinks that it doesn't exist anymore. So it has to keep traveling in the past and in the future so that it convinces itself that it exists. Okay, so it does this to guarantee to itself that it exists. And there's this Western philosopher called Rene Descartes who said this quote, I think, therefore I am. And Western society and science is based on this quote. They believe that they exist because they can think. But what Descartes has done is fallen into the trap of the mind, which is that it needs to keep moving to exist. But that's not true. So it does this to occupy itself. So what it does is it continues to plan for the future and it continues to reminisce at the past. Sometimes this can be very bad for us, and we'll look at that later on. But an example which kind of puts this 
into perspective and maybe something that you see in your daily life. For example, when we're doing salah, our body is doing the actions of salah. But our mind is not with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our salah. It's moving around. Maybe we're thinking about what do I have to do next? What am I going to eat for lunch? It's not thinking or it's not concentrating on salah. Something we need to do is to bring our mind back to the present and focus on the things that we're doing now. So to be able to do this, we need to look at what the consequences are of having a mindful relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which isn't in the present. So we'll start first of all with the future. What if our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was only in the future? Well, in that case, you're saying you have no relationship now, you don't have one in the past, but you want to have one in the future. That's procrastinating your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it means that you are trying to, you know, leave it off for another time. So maybe you're like doing something and you remember you haven't read Quran. And you're like, oh, I'll read Quran after Salat al-Maghrib. Or, oh, I'll do it later. Or, for example, you realize that your Salah is not up to scratch. And you're like, eh, I'm not going to work on it today. I'll wait until Ramadan and then I'll start working on my Salah. What we're doing there is we're procrastinating our actions towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we're procrastinating the relationship and the love that we can have with him. What we're saying is that you don't, you're not putting the effort in to be able to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his love as quickly as possible. And so we're going to give you an example which is going to kind of put all of this together. And this example is that of a trampoline. All right, so we're going to, this example of the trampoline is a representative of what we want to achieve in terms of the goal of reaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the legs of the trampoline are suliddi because they are the foundations that keep us up. The ladder which gets us to the trampoline is our wajibat. And the reason we require our wajibat is because to ensure that our usul din are secure, it means they are above nothing, correct? So with these legs of the trampoline, they're above the ground because if the trampoline was straight on the ground, then we can't bounce on it. This ladder, our wajibat, gets us to the platform. To protect us when we're bouncing, we have this net and this net is our hijab. It's the protection that we have so that when we are bouncing, we do not fall off, inshallah. And the actual fabric of the trampoline is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the fear of the akhirah, the future in the next life. So what would the bouncing be? So we said the bouncing is not the wajibat because the wajibat get us to love for Allah and the fear of the hereafter. But once we have the love of Allah and the fear of the hereafter, what we strive to do is extra mustahabbat or extra deeds for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what it is when we're bouncing on this trampoline. It's this additional day-to-day -day small actions that we're doing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we're procrastinating our relationship, it's kind of like we have set up this trampoline and we're leaving it out there. We never use it unless, you know, guests come over. This is really similar to an example, for example, of someone who doesn't pray at home, but when they go to a masjid, they do the best salah. So they're only using their trampoline when it suits them and they're in front of others. So it's not there for the purpose of getting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Instead, it's helping them and their ego. But here we've posed a new question. We said that our mind traveling to the future is not a particularly good thing, but fearing the future of al akhirah is good. So what is the difference between these two futures? So one of them is the future which is limited by time, and that's the future that we have on this dunya. And focusing on the future of this dunya is not good, and the reason for that is because it, pre it preoccupies us and it makes us forget the most important things to us, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, the future of the Akhirah, 
If we constant, constantly remember the Akhirah, then we remember the consequences of all our actions. And we also remember that there is a way or an end where we will be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is something that we are encouraged to continuously think about. And we have a tool. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this, um, you know, this thing which keeps us preoccupied with preoccupied with the future or thinking about the future. And this is al fatra al fatra is the motivation which gets us forward. How? Well, it has this, um, it leads us to the good. And the reason it leads us to the good is because it shows us the consequences of actions. And we recognize that the consequences of good actions get us to the future that we want in the hereafter. And so the fatra was made as the compass to our good future. And that is, you know, a gift and a blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, alhamdulillah, and a way to get to him and his love. However, because it is something which has been given to us, shaitan likes to use this, uh, this, you know, ability of us to foresee and look into the future for um, for bad and how he does that is he preoccupies us with the wrong type of future which is the future of the dunya so he uses what we have against us and we see this in different things for example we require desires so that we can survive in this world and so shaitan decides to use our desires against us so that we forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do the things that he wants us to do He's very good at doing this. And the reason why he does this instead of create something new, one, it's more efficient, and two, because it's something part of us, it is harder for us to recognize that it is wrong. So he's pretty tricky. He's the master of illusion. And that's why we really need to be careful. And we need to be able to control our mind before shaitan can get to it. Imam Ali alayhi salam has this um, hadith, and it says, and the reason for, uh, so do for this life as if you live forever and do for the hereafter as if you will die tomorrow. And so let's take these as two separate things. So do for your life as if you live forever. If you live forever, you won't care when you do something. So it means it's okay to procrastinate. And so procrastinating the things of the dunya compared so we're not saying procrastinating is good but we're we're comparing this to procrastination of things of the akhirah procrastination of the things of the dunya is much better to us than the things of the akhirah in fact we should be constantly thinking about our akhirah and constantly doing deeds for our akhirah because we do not know when our time will run out and so if we think that tomorrow will be our last day tomorrow will be our last day all our actions today will be to benefit our akhirah inshallah this is the stage that we'll be able to get to um but this is a good way for us to lead our lives and inshallah get to the stage where we die before death because we reach a stage where the dunya no longer matters and we've detached from it inshallah so we'll now look at um the past if we have a relationship with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is purely in the past you're pretty much saying that you have no relationship with him now which is bad because you're saying that you've left behind something which was better and today you have become worse than you used to be. So that's not something that you want either. And unfortunately, a lot of us fall in this trap. We fall into this trap of not using our trampoline always. So what happens, for example, in Ramadan, we get so spiritual. We do siyam, we get up and do salat al layl we read the entire Quran. As soon as Eid comes, we forget all of this. We no longer get up, for, we find it so hard to get up for Salat al-Subh sometimes. Like all the spirituality and the energy that we had in Ramadan gets lost. And so what has happened is we have gotten off this trampoline. Inshallah what will happen though is that we don't leave this trampoline for long so that it rusts. Because once it rusts, it becomes harder and harder to bounce on it. 
And remember, uh, in the Loving Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala lecture, we got a hadith from Imam Ali alayhi salam about shaykh, which said that if someone had shaykh in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala after he got his fitra, then no, no good can come from him ever again. And the reason for that is because once you have done this thing, but then you leave it for a long time, it rusts. And when it rusts, you can no longer use it again. The trampoline becomes useless. And that's a really, really sad thing. So the entire analogy of the trampoline, the point of it is, the goal of bouncing is to get higher and higher. But to be able to see your progress, you need to look at something. You look up. You look up because you see how closer and closer you're getting to what's above you. To be able to achieve a goal, you must look at the goal. And if our goal is to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we need to look at the direction that we need to go. And this is what dhikr is. And that's why it's very important for us to live in the present so that we can do dhikr and we can insha'Allah keep on Sirat al mustaqim and get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, dhikr and staying in the presence have other side effects which are beneficial to us. Some of these include if we keep living in the present and the past, it leads to many mental um, stresses or disorders. So if we continue to look at the past and regret our life choices or love the past and not the present because we're constantly comparing it, we can get into a state of depression. And that's a problem. But if we're continuously looking at the future and, oh my gosh, I need to get a job, I need to um, pass all my exams, I need to do this and this, you're building up stress and anxiety. And that's also another problem. So if we stay in the present, we get rid of all these issues. And we're not saying that you should never be in the past and the present because they do have their benefits. Like we need to look, the whole point of having memory is so that we can look into the past to learn from our mistakes. If we didn't know what we did before, which was say haram, how do we know that we're not repeating the same mistake? We need our memory. We need the past. However, we can't dwell on it too long. We can't live in it for too long. The same thing applies to the future. We need to set goals. We need to be able to plan ahead because then we're just kind of living life as it goes and that's not okay either. But to continuously live in the present and uh, future and wanting control of every aspect of our future, which we'll never get because it's a cone, not a line at the moment, then we'll never be able to have that um, relief of you know having control and so we'll only be in a state of stress and anxiety. However, this is easier said than done. We're constantly thinking what if, what if, what if. And so the only solution that we have to this is tawakkul. Tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But tawakkul does not come without us doing anything. So you can't be lazy and not study for an exam and have to work on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives, gives to the people who deserve. So if you want, say, a 50 in spesh, you have to put the effort and the work in and do to work on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by doing both of these together, you will get the best result for you as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees fit, inshallah. So the way that we need to be able to do this, train ourselves to be in the present, it's not easy. But we have to be the person who keeps an eye out on our mind. We have to be like a third person and constantly checking what our mind is doing. And if our mind keeps moving, tell it, come back, come back. So you're in salah and you feel yourself wandering into a different world, you have to snap out of it, tell yourself to come back. I mean, because the thing is, your mind is not a single person talking. It's multiple people talking to each other. So be that voice, that strict voice, which tells the other voices to be quiet for a second. In that way, you can train your mind to be in the present, inshallah. But while we're doing that training, shaitan has been working very hard against us to be able to manipulate our mind so that we're only concentrating on this dunya and we don't only mean Idris 
but we also need Shreya Atin and Ints. They have mastered their manipulation in economics and politics and in every aspect of society. And we need to be very cautious of what they're doing. So if you guys didn't know, a human can only make 300, uh, 35,000 decisions every day. You may think that's a lot, but that really isn't. It's a very limited amount. And so what happens is what they are trying to do is to take up as many of these choices in this world. So for example, they give you ads, they bombard you with ads that this is better than this, this is better than this, to make you make decisions, should I buy this or should I buy this? Or they make you believe that you need this, you need this, so you make a decision to buy this or to do a particular action which will only benefit your dunya. They're very manipulative. And to be able to understand the two strategies that they do this by, we need to introduce a concept. And this concept is called simplicity to multiplicity. So this concept, uh, this concept starts with that everything is a general concept. And this concept then gets branched into ideas. So for example, communication. That is a concept. It is something that humans want to do. We want to communicate. The idea is, is how do we communicate? You have speech, you have writing, you have technology. However, the, and then you have art. But then all of these are branched into multiple different ideas. So for example, with speech, you have public speaking, you have talking, you have debating, you have conversations. With technology, you have phones, walkie-talkies, laptops, all that kind of thing. And then that branches off emails, text messages, Facebook, Instagram, all that kind of thing. And the problem is, we have now learned that it's not enough to have one form of communication. Like nobody here picks up a phone to talk to their friends anymore. We need to have Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and WhatsApp because we can't survive without all four of them or more. That's a problem. What they have done is they've changed a simple concept, which is to communicate with others to multiple different things such that they made us even believe that we need all of these. And how much time does the media take up our lives, guys? We need to consider what we're doing. So now I want you to think, consider this. What is this? What do you think the concept is? And what is the idea? The concept is food. We need food to survive. However, most of you probably said this is a bowl of cereal or cornflakes. They have changed food from being something that uh, cavemen used to hunt and find just to stay alive to now we get to decide what food we want and we decide based on what we like and dislike. They've changed it from a simple thing of survival to a desire of what we want and what we don't want. They've even created something as loving food and hating types of food, astaghfirullah. Something which was a ni'mah we now have an opinion about and we've created something bad out of. And even cereal, it's not that easy. Look at how, I mean, I kind of feel bad for moms and dads when they have to go shopping for their kids because they have to make all these decisions in one shopping trip. How many decisions do you think your parents make? Just trying to get the food which will be suitable for your family. But not only that, so you think this was one thing that they were doing. They're also manipulating your choices. Because we have so many choices now, they've created things that are meant to help us to make choices. So for example, I'm sure you've seen ads of Trivago and Honey and Choosy. They're meant to be companies which help you to make these choices because they give you the comparisons. But what those companies do is they manipulate your choices because they only give you a limited range which will benefit them. And that's not good. But manipulation doesn't only stop at companies. It goes in the general, you know, in the general public. So for example, if you're in the supermarket, I'm going to play a small game to give you this example. I'm going to show you an image of a supermarket aisle for 30 seconds. I want you to look really carefully at the aisle and try to identify as many of the things on the shelves as possible. All right, this is the image. All right, that 
that's enough time. So there are many, many brands on those shelves and I hope you have a list in your head of which brands were on there. But where did your eyes go to first? What was the first thing you saw? You may not know the name of the brand, but what was it? Was it a bottle? Was it a can? What color was it? Try to remember what that is, all right? And I'm going to try and guess what that was, all right? So this is the image I showed you. And I'm guessing that the first thing you saw was around this section. It was either Gatorade or Red Bull or V. The reason that I think it was that is because did you know that companies have to buy their position their products are on the shelf? The supermarket doesn't decide that oh, the Gatorade goes on the second shelf. No, Gatorade actually paid Coles more money so that they can put their, uh, their product on that shelf. Because the thing is, each product has a different target audience. So for example, if you've seen the confectionery aisle where all the lollies are, the individual chocolate bars, they're always put on the bottom. They're not put at the top, they're put at the bottom because kids are their target. They want the kids who are walking next to the trolley to be like, I want this chocolate bar, can you buy it for me, mommy? So they put it down low so that the kids can grab it. As for the more adult things, they put them at eye level so that the adults can see them and purchase them. You'll also find that uh, uh, products with deals on them are always put on the lower shelves so that your eye is not caught to them or your attention is not caught to them. Only someone who's looking for a bargain will look to the bottom. But if you're just looking for a product, they put it at eye level. It's very tricky. And in that way, they're manipulating our choices because what they're doing is either saying, you don't have to make a choice and you can buy something and give us more money, or you can sit down and have to compare all the prices, spend more time, make more decisions just to buy the thing that you want. It's, it's pretty annoying. So what is a way that we, what is a strategy we can do to try and remove how complicated the shayapin of ints have made our life? We need to simplify. Simplify everything. And that's not easy. We're going to give you an example of someone who's done this. And this is not a typical example. Like this person isn't a good person. But in this particular thing of simplifying, they're very, very good at it. And that's Steve Jobs. So if you guys don't know, Steve Jobs is the founder of Apple. But the thing is, he's also got another trademark. And it is, it's his black turtleneck sweater. He always wears that. He's never worn anything else. And when he was asked one day, why do you always wear the same clothes to work? He said, because my decisions are valuable. My choices are valuable and I do not want to spend them on what I'm going to wear in the morning. So he has an entire wardrobe of black sweaters and he just wears them. And that way he doesn't have to make a choice about what to wear. We can apply this kind of thing in our life. Perhaps if we make a routine of what we're going to eat or you know what we're going to wear, we don't have to think about what we need to purchase because we have a list of items that we're always going to purchase. Or well, same thing with clothes. And in doing that, we're simplifying our lives and removing the amount of decisions we have to make on a daily basis. I know this is going to be hard <coughs> socially because it's going to make us look different. But inshallah, if we work together, it's not going to be that bad. And remember, it doesn't matter what society thinks. If you're doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it should not matter at all. So now that we know how to live in the present by simplifying our lives, it's time to get to dhikr. And what dhikr is. Remember in the first lecture, we talked how, about how worship was two types. It had a specific type and a general type. The same applies to dhikr. Dhikr is also two types. The specific dhikr is the tes this tasbihat that we do and you know the things that we say like subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, that is the specific dhikr. And one of the most recommended specific dhikrs we have is dhikr yunusi, which is the dhikr that you, uh, Yunus alayhi salam, Prophet Yunus alayhi salam did when he was inside the whale. And this is, la ilaha illa ant, subhanaka inni kuntu minal 
And it is also recommended that we repeat this dhikr 400 times a day. Just like in Tasbihat al-Zahra, there is a specific number of how many we, times we say any specific word, the same applies here. But the more we say uh, dhikr, the better it is going to be for us. As for general dhikr, that is to ponder the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to say subhanallah. Remember in the first lecture we talked about iqra and we said that the one of the definitions, oh the meanings of the word iqra and the most profound meaning of iqra was to see the rabubiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of creation. And this is dhikr. And inshallah, we'll be able to do this. So to help you in doing this, we're going to do an exercise. An exercise which will try and help you to look at the things that we have in our daily life at a different perspective, but also to show us what dhikr and the remembrance of the things around us, uh, of the rabubi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is actually telling us about ourselves, inshallah. So the first one is this. I want you to look at it and think about what it is. How has this been useful in our life? And what can we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for? This is a piece of crochet made out of wool by one of our dear sisters. And knitting and creating any kind of clothing has been so beneficial for humans over generations. It's kept us warm and this is a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the second image. And this is in fact a leaf, the close up of a leaf. All of these are where the water gets carried around and passed into all the small little cells of the plant so it can photosynthesize, so that it can produce fruit for us and become part of us if we decide to eat it or animals eat it. Remember this chain of ascension? So it is also one of the now of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What about this? These are the interneurons in our brain. This is what makes us move. It's amazing, right? What about this? This is the conceptualized structure of a quark. A quark is the thing, are the smallest things which create protons and neutrons and electrons. And then protons, neutrons and electrons make atoms. So we're made out of these things, these small, small things. And finally this. This is a very zoomed out image of something. It's actually a zoomed out image of the universe. Every single dot that you see in that image is a galaxy. So imagine how small we are compared to the universe. And there's a reason why we picked these images. It's not just because you've got to ponder about every single aspect of your life, which is true, but it's because everything in our life, including these things, have an interesting structure, which is very similar. They're all made out of these like string kind of things, really similar to spider web. And in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, an example of those who take supporters other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like a spider that made a house. The most fragile houses are those of a spider. Is. If they knew. Sorry, that's a typo. Remember the second ayah of Surah Al Alaq? We talked about the alaq specifically. We said that we are always being supported by the one qayyum, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this ayah, it tells us that if we take any supporter other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it will be like we have taken the support of something as weak as a spider web. And if we look at all the images before, everything in our world looks like a spider web even the entire universe. The smallest things that make us, the quarks, look like a spider web. And the largest thing which we're all encompassed in, the universe, looks like a spider web. 
if we depend on this dunya other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are surely to be lost. But dhikr is what will keep us looking at what our goal is, making us look towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and inshallah, it will stop us from being lost. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala keep thinking. Okay, so now we're going to move to the movie segment. And before we move on, we want to, first of all, give you some context to the clip, but then give you a reason why we picked this clip and the alternative options if you don't want to um, watch this clip particularly. So the, the, the clip that we picked is from a movie called The Road to El Dorado. And so the two the main characters in this movie, they are thieves and they were fugitives wanted in their home of Spain. So to run away from, you know, being caught, they decide to go on a, a trip to the new world and try to discover El Dorado. And when they do, all they want to do is now exploit all the gold in El Dorado so they can make a good future for themselves. So what they're doing is they're trying to escape their past and they're only thinking about the future. And so the particular clip we picked is when one of the characters realizes that he needs to just look at the present, look at what's around him, and this actually opens up his eyes and he says, I don't need the future that I'm thinking of. I don't need this gold anymore because it's not worth much. So that's the clip that we're going to show you. But the thing is, this clip has, a mu has music in the background. And the music is the thing that we want you to pay attention to to some degree, the lyrics, because um, it has a really nice meaning to it. However, we condemn listening to music in Islam. It's not, it's haram in most cases. In the small cases where it's halal, it's not recommended at all by all of our ulama. So we don't want you to do anything which you feel uncomfortable with. However, we want to give you, the thing is we live in a world where music is all around us and so we have some stories from ulama which teach us perhaps how to get around this. And there's a story of an anim who was uh, with one of his students and he was in a store and you know how in the store they play music in the background? Obviously, as mujtahideen, they've been accustomed to tuning out all haram. So this uh, uh, Sayyid was in the store and then he starts crying. And so his student asks him, why are you crying? And he's like, this person, she's talking to, the, uh, so he's talking about the song and he's saying this person, she's talking to the person that she loves. She's telling him that she misses him so much. And she reminded me how I miss Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this moment because I am here and not with him. So there is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us beauty and goodness in everything. And so we've found this in this particular clip, but unfortunately there is music in the background. So the alternative, if you do not want to watch this clip, um, is you can skip to the discussion at the end and we'll put in the descriptions a link to the lyrics where you could just read them um, so that you can understand what the words are without listening to the music, inshallah. Um, we apologize for this, but inshallah you will see the benefit um, in either way um, of the clip at the end and how it links to today's lecture inshallah.
so there were a few things that we want you to get from this clip. So the first thing was the whole reason behind this clip. So this is the clip which transformed this character's view about what he was doing. So instead of thinking about the future of them getting the gold and making a living for themselves in the new world, they were he was now thinking, I don't need the gold in the future because look at how beautiful the things around me are. I want to stay in El Dorado. And that's what he ends up wanting to do, staying in El Dorado and just living with the people. Um, the second thing from the images of the clip rather than the lyrics that we want you to take is remember the bit when he was uh, the dominoes thing. So first thing, the setup was a dark moon showing night. But then he was able to change that. And so the night was turned into daylight because he was able to change his perspective. And so sometimes we're in this life and we are hating what is happening to us at the moment. We have this really negative perspective of what is going on around us because we're comparing it to something which either happened in the past or happened to someone else. But what we need to do is realize that every present moment is a gem and it's a gem we'll never get back again. So we need to think that every moment in a positive light. Now we're going to look at the lyrics, which are really nice lyrics. And the first one is at the beginning. So the start of it, it says, the more I learn, the more I see, the less the world impassions me. So the more he's learning about, the, so for us, if we apply this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more we learn about Islam, and the more we want to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the less we become attached to this world. This dunya will mean nothing to us because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only thing we're striving for. The second bit says, um, the, um, the, the something heart, the Roman eye. And it's talking about how, and come to rest, do not apply. And it's talking about how, when we're attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our heart will never be lonely, it will never be lost, it will be constantly with Him, it will be constantly beating forever. And our eyes, they won't be wondering, looking for a purpose, because they already have a purpose. It doesn't apply to us because we've now found what we're trying to be with this entire time, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then if we look at the chorus, it says, I believe in anything in everything were it not for you showing me by just existing only this is true i love you so it, if we apply this again to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what we're saying is that i the only reason i believe in anything and everything that i believe in is because of you not because you told me how or showed me because you exist and i know that you exist and just because you exist, I love you. It's really nice if we can apply that in our life, inshallah. Um, and that's the end of today's lecture. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.